Hi, welcome all again, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Sarah, and I'm one of the Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake's Program and Outreach Coordinators. And before we get started, I'd like to just go over a brief tech orientation that you'll see here on the next slide, just to ensure a pleasant experience for tonight's program. Uh, we do ask that you keep yourself muted during this presentation. Also, if you need to get up and move around, we please ask that you turn off your camera. This session is being recorded. Uh, so again, if you do not wish to be shown during this webinar, please turn off your camera now. There will be time for Q&A at the end where you will be able to unmute or use the chat function um, if you choose. And it's a wonderful way to ask for help during the program if you should need assistance. Uh, one of our wonderful IPC staff will be happy to help. Next, you'll see some of our lovely staff um, on a, a wonderful holiday party that we had. Here I'm seated, uh, I'm seated at the end up front. And if you are in the DMV area and looking to connect, please contact me, there's all my information. Next, you'll see a program lineup as we will begin with a land acknowledgement and an opening reflection, followed by some information about our organizations for new folks in the room. We'll also hear from our inspiring speakers and meet our panelists, which afterwards we will again open the floor for Q&A and we will close with a prayer. So now I would like to take a moment to acknowledge this land and these waters that were stewarded by many who came before, and please join us while muted in recognition. For today, we hold space for reflection on and gratitude for the land upon which we live and the local waters that support and nourish us all. We recognize that this land and these waters were stewarded by many who came before. We reflect together as people of faith in response to the calling of our hearts to come alongside the original stewards of this land and these waters that sustain us all. We seek to change the narrative of this story, our story towards one of harmony with the gifts of creation and all living beings. We ask you to honor and learn from their intimate connection, love and appreciation of these sacred lands and waters. And you can click on the link that's in the chat to learn more. It's gonna take you to a map that will share some of the history of this region and those original stewards, but please keep in mind that this link shares the most recent up to around a thousand years prior of history, which there are more than 15,000 years of indigenous history in the region. Thanks so much. Now I'd like to open with a reflection from a famous poet who often depicted man in different natural settings and scenes. Robert Frost wrote this beautiful poem appropriate to share as we await for spring's arrival. Oh, give us pleasure in the flowers today and give us not to think so far away as the uncertain harvest. Keep us here all simply in the springing of the year. Oh, give us pleasure in the orchard white like nothing else by day. Like ghosts by night and make us happy in the happy bees. The swarm dilating round the perfect trees and make us happy in the darting bird that suddenly above the bees is heard, the meteor that thrusts in with needle bill and all of blossom in mid air stand still. For this is love and nothing else is love to which it is reserved for God above to sanctify to what far ends he will, but which it only needs that we will fulfill. And thanks for taking that moment together with me I want to shift gears um, and just share our gratitude for our sponsors that fund our work, as you can see on this slide. Uh, they give us the capacity to operate as a connector organization that you'll see depicted on our next slide. And it just helps us um, connect organizations in search of resources, uh, resources to pursue environmental stewardship projects with the support from local uh, government agencies and alternate funding sources, and of course, us. Um, so if you want to find out more, and who's already partnering with us, you can learn more about our One Water Partnership pledge uh, that you can see here on the next page and a map of all of those who are joining this movement. And so we also wanna mention that our next Green Teams Faithful Leaders Training is coming up this June. And for any Green Teams out there, if you haven't already signed up, please do. And if you are new to us, please stay in touch by just taking a look at our resource page. Um, we help and build your efforts at places of worship and more, and you can check us out at any time to see what's up to date in your area. All right, well, we are ready to dive right into the topic that has brought us together here this evening. As we prepare for the renewal that spring offers, it's important to learn how we can protect our precious pollinators so they can 
continue to support us. Uh, so tonight, um, I'd like to start with the founder of Firefly Conservation and Research, uh, which is a, an amazing organization dedicated to conservation and educational organization um, that works to conserve fireflies and their habitats through these efforts um, in outreach and restoration. And so please give a warm welcome to Ben Pfeiffer. and we can stop share. And I did uh, make you host. If not, let me go ahead and double check that so you can share. Um, well, while she's taking that uh, done, I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, like she had introduced me, my name's Ben Pfeiffer. Um, I founded uh, Firefly Conservation and Research 13 years ago. Um, and uh, I study Texas fireflies uh, here in Texas and in the Southwest. I work primarily uh, to study uh, species here to kind of illuminate their life history um, and bring about um, information that's previously unknown. I do a lot of conservation work as well and do a lot of speaking uh, throughout the country. Um, and tonight I'm going to give you a presentation um, at, of, about fireflies uh, in the United States um, and specifically kind of in, in Maryland. Um, so uh, tonight, um, if you have any questions during the presentation, um, if you want, you can post them in the chat function um, and we'll get to those. I know Sarah has a, um, a question and answer allowed at the end that we'll get about 10 minutes for and I'll try to get to any questions that uh, myself or one of the other speakers uh, has. Um, so. Um, I just want to start off by saying uh, firefly season's coming just around the corner, um, so it's going to be pretty soon for us. So this is kind of a nice time for us to talk about fireflies. Um, and I hope that you leave with uh, some just valuable information about how you can help firefly conservation efforts, um, maybe possibly bring fireflies into your own land, um, ways that your congregation can engage in conservation activities for pollinators, but also for fireflies, um, and uh, just learn some kind of fun stuff about fireflies. So I'm gonna go ahead and get it started. All right, looks like we're ready to go. Okay, um, well to start off, um, usually people wanna know exactly what are fireflies and fireflies are beetles. Um, they go by a lot of different names, and you might know them as lightning bugs or fireflies or that glowy thing over there in the bush. Um, but whatever you call them, they are um, beetles, and they're in the order Cleoptera, which has around 400,000 species worldwide. So it's a really diverse group. All fireflies belong to the family Lampyridae, and all members in the family Lampyridae um, have various shared characteristics. Um, so you might be wondering, um, well, what makes a firefly a firefly besides the actual glowing that they do or the flashing? Um, one of the cool things about fireflies is that they bioluminesce as adults and as juveniles. Um, so uh, from the early part of their development, they do have the ability to glow. Um, they have relatively soft, elongated bodies. Uh, we like to sometimes call these squishy beetles. Um, we, some of us probably have stories about catching fireflies and kind of smashing them in our hands and rubbing the goo, uh, the glowy glue all over. And I hear about that often. Um, so they're, they're pretty uh, soft beetles, but um, they have uh, some key morphological features that we like to talk about. They have a flattened head shield um, called a pronotum um, that you can see in the upper right hand corner. Um, they have uh, basic uh, two uh, wings and that head uh, cover basically shields their eyes. Now this shield cover is something that as scientists we look at a lot closer because um, it sometimes will have diagnostic features that help us de determine species sometimes. Um, if you look in the lower right hand corner, you'll see a firefly that's got kind of a black spot on that head shield. And um, that is, uh, sometimes it's a black blob, a line, an arrow, an anchor, um, and it just can vary in different colors. Now, most species of fireflies are about five to 20 millimeters long. 
Um, to kind of put it in perspective, down in South America, you can get fireflies that are as big as like 44 millimeters long. So that's two to three inches. So if you can imagine hiking around in the, the jungles of Brazil and a three inch firefly comes and lands on your head, that's pretty significant <laughs> and make you jump pretty quickly. Um, and then five millimeters long is about, about the size of a grain of rice. Um, so really small. Uh, this is a little bit about firefly anatomy, um, and I'll just touch on this briefly, but um, just if you ever catch a firefly, um, look at it a little bit closer, um, and you'll notice some kind of key things about it. This will help you differentiate between bugs and insects that look like fireflies. Um, there are insects in the animal kingdom that mimic fireflies because fireflies have a poisonous compound in them that make them distasteful to predators. So a uh, firefly is going to have a head shield usually with a, a kind of prominent spot on that shield. I have two wing covers called the latra, uh, and uh, it has six legs. Some fireflies have what's called an elatral margin that has this kind of yellowish color that's around the wings, and that's helpful as well. It has 11 segments in its antenna, and it's got two eyes. This is what a female and a male firefly look like. Now, off the bat, you might be able to notice some key differences. Um, the female off to your left has uh, a kind of a smaller light organ, and the light organ is going to be seen in those abdominal segments that you see there. Um, she's got one light organ, and then the male over off to your right has two light organs. Um, the female doesn't need to devote as much energy uh, to light production. Her primary goal is to produce eggs, and so she needs to conserve energy as much as possible. Well, the males, on the other hand, they're trying to be the brightest, as they possibly can. And so a lot of their energy is devoted to light production, as you can see by these uh, two large um, light organs here. Now for such a small insect, um, they uh, produce, uh, a lot of their body is, is, is like kind of a ratio of those light organs is, is quite high. Um, and in some species that are quite small, the light organs take up like a third of their body. So it's pretty interesting how much that uh, they are driven towards light and producing light in a form of sexual communication. So diversity of fireflies in the United States. There's around 2,400 species worldwide um, and the U.S. has about 180 and they're still discovering new species um, yearly. There's about 25 species in Maryland and um, excuse that typo but George, Georgia in Florida and Texas have about the highest diversity. So about 40 to 50 species, which is quite high. Um, and uh, it's really nice that there is some really good diversity in Maryland. And so when you go out, you'll be able to discover a lot of different species out there. These include diurnal, but also nighttime flying. So these are fireflies that will fly during the day, um, but also at nighttime. Now the nighttime flying, I'm sorry, the daytime flying fireflies usually don't flash, they use pheromones. So this is some of the basics of firefly uh, life cycle. Uh, you can see from this chart that a large portion of it is taken up in the larval uh, development side. And you'll see that uh, they live as larva for about one to two years, uh, which is really surprising to a lot of people because most of the time when you see a firefly, you see it flashing and you think that that is primarily its main um, kind of structure or what it looks like. But for the most part, it spends a lot of its time as a larva. And off to your left, you'll see an example of a larva in the lower left-hand corner. Now, off to your right is an image of a firefly larva that just hatched from the egg. And you'll notice right at the end of its tail, it kind of looks like a bright spot. Now, this is a larva that is glowing as soon as it comes out of the egg. Uh, and this goes back to some of the shared characteristics um, that I talked about uh, in, earlier in the presentation about how juveniles and adults also flash as well. Now, to your left is an example of a pupa. Um, that's that kind of yellow uh, stage. It's that kind of form of metamorphosis that happens between the larva um, and the adult. And adults only live about three to four weeks. Some even live long, less than that. Um, and then it's, all, it's done. Um, so uh, not a lot of uh, their time is spent in the adult cycle. So firefly habitat, 
Um, this is something we'll touch on, but it's it's basically fireflies are habitat specific. They love warm and humid areas, forests, fields, ponds. Riparian corridors are their primary um, place that they live. So this is wetlands, uh, marshes, forest edges, anywhere there's a lot of good consistent moisture. And riparian corridors are where about or only take up about one percent of all land type. So it's a really important land uh, that. Uh, we want to go ahead and uh, basically preserve. Flash patterns. So fireflies flash in order to signal to uh, females, but their flash patterns differ in quite a few ways. The chart on your uh, right will actually show just some examples of different flashes. Notice how some fly high in the treetops is low and some, flow, some uh, flash lower in, in the grass there. They, they vary based on how hot it is outside. The hotter it is, the faster they flash. The color can differ, the number of flashes, and interval of time between flashes. So um, why do they, how do they choose a mate? Um, what's this whole flashing business in the first place? Well, it basically summarized as flying males broadcast signals as they search for females. And then females respond to this intraspecific variation in male flash timing by a couple different ways. So the question that comes up is, what do female fireflies prefer in male fireflies? Um, and you might just think for a second, if you're a female firefly, what characteristics are you looking for in a male? I was uh, given this presentation one time um, and uh, I asked this question and there was a, a person in the front who piped up and said, a sense of humor. So I don't know if uh, uh, females uh, like a sense of humor in male firefighters or not, but uh, the answer is uh, they like longer flashes and faster flash rates. Um, a lot of this signals uh, a more robust male that's going to basically sire more offspring with the, for the female. So how are fireflies helpful? Well, they generally act as nature's pest control. So the larva are predaceous. They crawl along the forest floor and they consume snails and earthworms and other uh, soft bodied insects. Um, some adult fireflies even kind of eat their own kind. And you can act them, act as, they kind of act as uh, keeping those pest insects in control uh, so they don't get out of control. So uh, they do a good job of, of, as larvae, as basically helping to control the ecology on the forest floor um, or in a wetland area. They act as a really good indicator for the health of an environment. Um, if an environment gets polluted or becomes uh, degraded in some ways, um, fireflies disappear. Um, so if you've got fireflies, a lot of times it's a good signal for a healthy environment. Uh, they're medically useful too. They use them in food safety and cancer research and for the development of new drugs. Uh, so are they disappearing? This is a question that uh, I get asked a lot and is uh, has a lot of information on the website that I started. The, the answer is yes, unfortunately, fireflies are disappearing. Um, and there's empirical evidence to kind of support this now. About 14% of firefly species in North America are classified as critically endangered, uh, endangered or vulnerable. Now, Maryland actually has one critically endangered firefly um, and that is uh, the Bethany beach firefly. Uh, Futurus bethanensis. Um, it occurs in Delaware, but there are sightings that occur in Maryland, actually, um, along the coast. And it primarily occurs in sand dunes um, in very rare wetland habitat that occurs right on uh, kind of the beach area. Um, and uh, this is uh, getting listed for potential federal uh, in endangered species listing. Um, and uh, it will probably get it. Um, because its habitat is very restricted. Uh, what we do know from this information is there's a really urgent need for the conservation of their habitats. So why are they disappearing? Well, let's talk about that really quickly. One of them is pollution and then it's just the loss of repairing corridors. Um, loss of repairing corridors is basically that, that land, that interface between the water and, and the land and it's basically uh, getting degraded, eroded, polluted, um, and replaced with invasive species. Uh, light pollution is another one. Uh, light pollution affects fireflies by 
uh, disrupting the signals between males and females from able to, this, to signal to each other. Um, the light kind of washes out their flashes. Uh, pesticide use is also another one, particularly broad spectrum pesticides that are kind of sprayed in lawns. And I thought I had another slide. Okay, I guess not. Um, disappearing water tables. This is showing Texas here, but this is kind of aquifer pumping that's uh, causing a lot of springs and things to disappear. Um, how you can help fireflies. One of the good things is that if you have habitat um, or if your congregation has land um, or if you have a preserve that's nearby, one of the best things you can do to start is just assess your soil health. Uh, poor soil equals poor habitat for firefly food. So think about the soil, if it's compacted or has the, uh, does not have the ability in order to take in nutrients or moisture, think of like a concrete, uh, like, or asphalt a parking lot. Well, that's not growing anything. Um, and so look at the soil and you can make amendments to your soil to introduce new nutrients. You can avoid use of broad spectrum pesticides. You can ad advocate for adopting local policies to control light pollution. Um, and the way you do this is go to your city government to suggest dark sky policies um, and make slow changes over time. Um, maybe you don't need to suggest a full extent of uh, light pollution uh, uh, remediation policies, but you can um, suggest some things to put downward facing lights, or if you've got a particular area that's got light shining in it um, that's protected, see if you can get that changed. And these small things over time definitely help. Um, one of the things you can do too is protect critical habitat. So if you've got uh, habitat that you're aware of or you wanna provide, um, you wanna basically provide undisturbed cover for these adults and, and firefly larvae. Um, and to do this, you get to know your habitat. So from May to August, generally try to avoid land clearing or habitat disruption that disturbs the top, so uh, uh, top soil surface level. Um, larval development happens at the ground level so any activities that disrupt uh, fireflies during this time can affect firefly populations. Reduce light pollution. Um, artificial light at night, we, we basically call Allen, uh, might be one of the main drivers of firefly decline in the United States. Uh, You're all familiar with LED lights and um, the proliferation of LED lights across uh, the United States. One, because they're cheap and they're energy efficient, but they have a negative impact on uh, critters that live during the night, um, mainly because they're so bright and the light that they put out is in such a wide spectrum of very bright white bluish light that it uh, affects uh, a lot of different insects and animals and fireflies are just one of them. Um, and mainly because uh, those lights wash out their flashes. Um, and so in order to remedy this, um, if you have outside lights, uh, consider using a warm yellow or amber colored LED light, um, kind of in the 600 to 700 nanometer range. Um, these are less visible to insects. Um, you change your light bulbs. Um, so get some light bulbs that are kind of in the warmer color. They make light bulbs specifically for bugs um, and uh, you can install those. Remove decorative lights, install motion sensors and timers, and close your blinds. Plant natives, um, if you've got some land um, and you're connected um, with uh, some local naturalists or uh, people that are uh, passionate about native plants, um, try to plant native species in your, uh, your, your habitat. Um, this will go a long ways. Um, native species of plants um, encourage leaf duff um, to accumulate. Um, and it's basically just leaf litter. Um, and just a reminder, manicured gardens with heavy mulch layers are really poor firefly habitat. And the reason for that is that moisture is not able to penetrate the soil surface with heavy mulch layers. So it's really good to till that um, or uh, kind of reduce that as best you can. The other thing you can do is certify your firefly habitat. Um, this was a program that uh, we launched last year. It's the first of its kind of certification. And it focused on four areas of importance. Um, it's self-directed, and so when you purchase a sign, it will ask you various questions on your habitat um, and provide a guide for you to basically accomplish this. Um, and you can visit firefly.org slash certify or just visit firefly.org and click on certify um, to like learn more about this. Uh, this makes a great gift for uh, a naturalist or somebody that loves uh, fireflies or just in general. If they've got a pollinator habitat, um, you can turn it into a firefly habitat as well. 
Um, so I'm just going to, I don't have a lot of time left, but I'm just going to touch on a couple fireflies that you might find um, in Maryland. Um, and so the primary one that you'll come across uh, this spring and this summer is going to be the Photinus fireflies. Um, this is also the most commonly encountered genera we have in Texas. And so uh, we have about 15 to 20 species. Um, and what you're going to have in Maryland is what's called the Big Dipper firefly, Photinus pyralis. And it's a medium-sized firefly that's most common in the early evening. And this is what Photinus pyralis looks like. Now, if you look closely, um, you'll see that a lot of the uh, fireflies have a black spot. Um, now, there's an image there up in the kind of off to the right, basically showing um, a, a firefly flying and then also the kind of the ventral side of the firefly. And you'll notice that there's a black spot there. So that's kind of a quick way to do it. Uh, females, again, have only one light spot, light organ, as you can see with these uh, examples here. Um, they have a yellowish to orange kind of single long flash, and they flash every four to six seconds. Um, and then females will respond with a, a flash about every two seconds. And they make a distinctive J motion as they fly upwards. But tourist fireflies, um, these are usually seen in late May to late June, um, and these are also present in Maryland. Um, they're nearly impossible to ID based on flash pattern, dissection, or DNA analysis, mainly because they're a very complex species. Um, some of these fireflies uh, will mimic up to 13 different flash patterns, so it's very hard to ID them. They're known as the femme fatale fireflies, and they Basically, uh, they, they're known because of this, is because they're known to mimic the flash pattern of other species. And they, what, the reason they do this is that this genus of fireflies does not make compounds that make them poisonous to other insects and other birds and predators. So they have to basically lure in other species of fireflies in order to eat them to obtain these compounds. Um, so kind of a uh, kind of uh, interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, and these compounds are called lucibufagans. This is a Futurus versicolor complex, which is present in Maryland um, and is widespread across the United States. We like to call these the big scary predator fireflies and you'll see them late in the evening from 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. Um, and their range is widespread in all of Texas and uh, up the East Coast into all the way up till, oh man, Maryland, uh, into Maine, actually. Um, and they're very erratic. They mimic, uh, mimic a lot of different flash patterns, as I mentioned, um, and they're really just hard to ID. So there's many species within this complex. This is an example of a, a, a versicolor flashing in a habitat. Um, and you can see how they fly over uh, the trees here um, and kind of emit a kind of one second flash. This is kind of a, just a beautiful image um, showing uh, just kind of an example of how fireflies operate at night. Um, you'll see some that flash kind of lower towards the river corridor and then some that flash uh, kind of higher. Um, and they just have different modes um, as they flash throughout the night. So that's my time. And I just want to thank you for attending. Um, and inviting me to come participate uh, in the Interfaith uh, webinar tonight. Um, it's been a, a joy. Um, please consider donating to our cause to help firefly conservation and, and support research efforts, um, and then purchasing some sign that can, can support conservation in your area. Um, and feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Um, and I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Sarah now. Thanks so much, Ben. There is a lot of uh, really cool facts that I didn't know about. Um, it's amazing to hear that they're also discovering new species. Um, also really cool to see that they start glowing when they're born. And I loved hearing about um, how we can help them. There were a lot of questions that were coming through the chat. Um, and as I reminded folks, we will have room um, at the end. But two that are just jumping out, if you don't mind just um, maybe hearing out while we're um, moving on to the next speaker, um, two that popped out were, are they salt tolerant? Mm. And do, okay. does mosquito control affect populations? Yes, that's a great question about the mosquito control and um, also the salt as well, uh, because, uh, you know, during the winter, you're going to need to spread salt to prevent ice. Um, they are not really salt tolerant. So I would say if you are going to use salt to control, try to keep it on 
places that it's not going to uh, get significant runoff. Um, you just really want to avoid salt in areas that uh, potentially have a, a, like a, a abundance of larva. But for the most part, um, you know, salt is generally safe for the roads and it dissipates uh, relatively after like it, it, you know, when after the freeze. So but I would just you, you wouldn't want to go into a forest habitat and just spread salt around into the thing. Um, and so, yeah, definitely keep it on the roads. But larvae are likely not salt uh, tolerant just because it will cause them to desiccate, essentially. Um, and we don't want that. One thing to note, though, is that fireflies are pretty tough as in the larval state. Um, there's a lot of stories about, um, you know, floods and hurricanes that come through and that I've seen over the years. And you, it's amazing to see how an area gets flooded and how fireflies um, can hold their breath for weeks at a time in some cases. Um, and so you'll see fireflies migrate um, when a flood comes through down the river and stuff. So um, they're adaptable. They're tough. They're beetles, after all. Um, now, to answer the question about mosquito uh, control, um, the general thought is, is that um, when people spray for mosquitoes, they're generally not spraying usually in a time when mosquitoes are active. A lot of times they do it beforehand. Um, and the pesticide that mosquitoes that they use to kill mosquitoes is rather weak. Um, and so fireflies as beetles um, are a, a lot tougher than mosquitoes that are rather fragile, basically. Um, it's not a great idea to spray for mosquitoes in a firefly habitat because it is going to persist uh, potentially and can harm them. So we generally rec do not recommend that. Um, it's, 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 it's really issues when, um, you know, municipalities start spraying um, abundantly to, you know, kind of remedy fears about Zika and a variety of different other things that happen. I don't know if y'all remember a few years ago, but Zika was a kind of a big thing that happened. And there was communities across the United States, a few that decided to just basically bomb their um, areas uh, with heavy pesticides. And there's places like in Oklahoma and stuff like that, that basically lost out of all their fireflies um, and a lot of other species because they got so saturated with pesticides, it killed everything. And now they will come back over time, but um, yeah, pesticide usage um, with mosquito spray, sometimes uh, you do have to use it to control pest insects um, like mosquitoes and prevent disease spread. Um, but uh, the, the, uh, the pesticide usage is, is very light, I would say. So I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Thank you for those questions, Sarah. Thanks. And thank yeah, you for thank those you, for asking them. I'll give you a chance to look in the chat because uh, like I said, there are definitely some more coming, but I want to make sure that um, I give the floor to our next speaker. Um, this is a really cool story. Um, Kevin Carpenter Driscoll is the environmental coordinator over at the um, Department of Public Works, City of Greenbelt, which is a very, uh, that city is close to my heart. And they are the state of Maryland's first firefly sanctuary. And so he's going to be here to talk about how that happened and how he brought the community together on this really cool project. And so I'll hand it over to Kevin. Everyone give a warm welcome to Kevin. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Ben. That was uh, incredibly insightful uh, about these really awesome and iconic creatures. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you all about um, as Sarah mentioned, our Firefly Sanctuary and how this community got that started. Um, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. I've just got a few slides and I'll be um, uh, quicker than, than Ben for sure. Um, he has so much wonderful information. All right. Okay. So uh, as mentioned, I'm the environmental city of Greenbelt um, through our Department of Public Works. Uh, and I wear a lot of hats. I, I work mostly working in right. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt, Kevin. You just went out um, for audio. Yeah, the, the sound just cut out. Uh, bear with us one moment. Sorry. 
that, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit of our story tonight. And um, I'm here with Linda Barrett, who I'm Maureen Malloy, and I'm here with Linda Barrett, who is my pollinator partner in all things at our church. And here you're uh, seeing a picture of our church, which is the a Unitarian <laughs> Universalist <laughs> Church of Silver of Spring, Silver Spring there better, you go. better known as UUCSS. Um, and th this is a view of, of our church before we did any of our environmental uh, renovations that we're going to talk about tonight. Will you put the timer on so I don't talk too long? Um, Unitarian Universalists have eight different principles um, that we sort of abide by. And the seventh one is respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Sarah. So... We've had a what we've called a green sanctuary and now are calling our green team for many, many years at the church. And um, it was really only in the last couple of years that we started to turn our attention to the grounds of our of our church property and really develop a vision of what we could do on our grounds, um, not just to beautify the grounds, but to really start to transform them in ways um, that would make a big difference to the earth. So we wanted to install, get rid of our invasives that are on the property and install native plants that would provide shelter and food for different kinds of wildlife. We wanted to get some new trees, which could sequester carbon and uh, also wanted to just do conservation landscaping that could um, help with some of the other problems on the property like erosion and stormwater management. So uh, once we had this vision, we started looking for resources since we are have a $400 budget for the entire year for this committee. Um, so next slide, please, Sarah. We found Interfaith Partners of the Chesapeake and our first project was in December of 2022. We had uh, 13 native shade trees installed on the property. Um, you can go to our, they're, they're thriving. They're about 15 months old now and they're they're doing really well. Okay. Um, and so Sarah and Interfaith Partners really um, helped us identify other sources of resources. You can go to the next slide. And so we were encouraged to go in to the Chesapeake Bay Trust for a small grant. Um, and for that project, we chose uh, one area of the property that was really in need of restoration. And we said we would remove the invasive species. Uh, and you can see a lot of overgrown uh, plants and vines and ground cover in the first slide. And that we would take about, um, fifth, get about 1,400 square feet of invasives removed and put in about 1,500 uh, native plants. So here you can see us installing those plants, which happened um, in October of last year. And the next slide, Sarah, actually is a video. If you can run that down at the bottom. Yeah, this is a video that Linda took after we finished planting that day. As you can see, we added some hardscape, both to make pads for um, maintenance and weeding and also for people to enjoy this, enjoy this space. So we have put in a bench and um, bird feeder. We have a little free library that's having information about seeds and plants. And we have not installed our signage yet. Uh, we're gonna have a dedication for this garden um, in, in the spring. So it's a work in progress, but the hard part's done. Okay, next slide. Um, well, while we're getting to the next slide. Okay, so part of this grant, it's important to know if you're thinking of looking for funding, was not just doing the environmental work, but also um, doing a variety of education and outreach events through the grant. So this was our probably our first big event, which was Earth Day last year. Um, we planted a little pollinator garden there that you can see in the front. We had children's activities and we had a table on invasive species and on uh, green cleaning products and things like that. Next slide, please. Uh, then we did a, a big pollinator festival in June. We had a lot of fun activities for kids and families, a lot of information about um, what is a pollinator, what is pollination, what kind of uh, 
native plants can you put in different different conditions for your yard and um we had a plant giveaway we talked to people about what would be good for their particular yard we had a hands-on part where people who really weren't gardeners could just learn how to how to plant a plant um, okay next slide please and our, our religious education folks put together a Sunday their Sunday school around pollinators for the summer, which was another program. Okay. Also, we um, in our grant we partnered with the Silver Spring Nursery School, and the school rents uh, classroom space from our church, and they have for many many years. So it was natural that we would have a partnership with them. And this is a little pollinator garden that. Um, their two two and three year olds helped <laughs> helped install this yeah. summer, which was super fun. And that Linda and I at at an event that the nursery school sponsored for their families in the spring, where we had a plant giveaway and information on pollinator plants. Next slide. And lastly, we uh, did a series of talks and workshops with our congregation. Um, over the course of the year, the, the slide here is of a seed sowing workshop that we did in, I think, December, where mm -hmm. yeah took milk jugs and sowed seeds in them. They're overwintering outdoors now. Um, on, on the far right is Linda doing a workshop on uh, when and how to prune your trees and shrubs. And this Saturday, we have one on getting your yard ready for the spring preparing for the spring really just sitting back and relaxing <laughs> you know, the last month before it gets busy um and we've had a lot, a lot of other programs but that's a few and last slide lessons learned i just wanted to mention quickly um gardeners are your best friends we got a lot of new folks on our green team who came out when we started doing this work because they, they were just super interested in gardening and native plants and they were not active in our green team before that so that's been a really wonderful thing. Um, I lost the slide, but just oh, really quickly, two and three are kind of combined. We found um, inexpensive and sometimes free ways to get native plants. Bonaterra Nursery was giving away seedlings. We grew some ourselves and of course some we bought, but we were able to leverage those resources so that we had some money to pay a very strong 27-year-old named Victor who moved lots of dirt and put down all those big stones. And seriously, um, it's it's important that if you're going to try to do this work with volunteers, you really may need to um, have some money to, to work with the hard parts. Um, and lastly, maintenance is crucial but challenging. Um, those 13 shade trees, um, if you want to guess how long it takes to water those trees, which are spread all around our grounds, involved five or six different hoses and <laughs> I think it was many about, volunteers in a couple hours at least per week so yeah. yeah it's not the fun glamorous part it's not as fun as putting the plants into the ground and watching all the flowers um, but as we look forward to um, other parts of the property that we'd like to work on that that is something we have to consider really carefully is just how much maintenance is involved and um, any grant you go after will want to know that Okay, thank you so much. I left my email in case anyone wants to contact me about specific questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Maureen and Linda for joining. Um, I've really loved to just express the gratitude, the relationship that we've built um, over the, which is wild to think couple years, <laughs> has just been really rewarding. And we're so grateful for all the energy and expertise and just um, everything that you do. Um, so thank you for joining us and sharing. And yeah, I hope you don't mind in the post recording. I'll definitely give folks your email um, if they want to contact and ask about some of these projects and programs. I think it would be a great time to open up the floor for Q&A. Um, and we can put that slide up so folks can see that. But at the moment, um, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, we're going to go through the chat and try to get to some of the questions um, that were that were started with the first speaker. And I'll read one um, because this, this caught my attention too. Uh, do they eat slugs as well? You mentioned that they eat snails. Um, would they happen to also 
eat slugs. Yes, they do. Um, they have a little bit harder time with the bigger slugs that have kind of a thicker kind of uh, like soft membrane, but they do eat slugs. So that's a good reason to keep them around. <laughs> And we did also have someone ask if there's any way you would be able to elaborate on those lawn chemicals, um, which ones are most hazardous. I know you mentioned like the general use. Um, do yeah. you have any that you might recommend um, folks to use as, as opposed to the general? Yes. Um, so uh, here's the issue with lawn chemicals. Um, it has to deal with the, the pesticide, the pest companies, pest control companies that you hire to come to, to address your lawn. And usually what they're trying to target is grubs within the ground. Um, and a lot of times those grubs that they're killing that are eating the roots of your grass are beetles. Um, they're beetle species. Uh, they're just in a kind of grub larval state. And so when they spread a kind of a broad spectrum pesticide on the lawn, they're basically killing any of those kind of beetles that are below the surface. Um, the general issue with it is that we want to kind of avoid broad spectrum pesticides and try to use more targeted uh, pesticides if we are going to use, uh, try to control things in our lawn. One of the ways to do this is maybe alternate years. So one year you don't do it and another year you do. Um, you want to give some kind of chance for stuff to come back. Um, there are some like natural ways in order to control those kind of sort of things. Um, and you might want to look at more organic uh, ways in order to control pe pests uh, there. We want to kind of always try to strike a balance uh, with nature, especially if we have a preserve or uh, trees near us. Um, th some of the literature points to neonicotoids. Um, those are pesticides that are water soluble and they, they do get in the soil. So a couple tips if you are have spray for, for pesticides in your lawn is to one, talk to your pest control company and ask them what kind of chemicals they use. Um, ask them if they are a neonicotoid um, kind of uh, pest, pesticide. Um, and those are ones that you wanna use because they are water soluble and they get into the soil. Um, and then try to find ways to minimize any overspray. So uh, if you've got a, an area that has fireflies, try to, uh, go out there and tell the, the pest control person, don't spray here. Um, and uh, that would be a great way. Um, somebody had their hand up, I guess was asking a question, but I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. Yeah, yeah there's a question here for Kevin, who I, I think probably your audio is fine. Um, somebody's asking, Karen's asking, did you survey your sanctuary first? to see if there were enough fireflies or do you designate it as a sanctuary first? You didn't. Um, that area was, was already, I um, well, we didn't do any particular surveying uh, and like a sign, it was, it was just that the population there was really is. Okay. All right. So I think what he said was um, they didn't, you didn't do a survey um, and the sanctuary was already designated. The, the area was already identified as uh, a high quality firefly area. Uh, okay. Area. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. And Carol, please go ahead and, and unmute. Hi. Um, I had a, I had a couple questions. Um, one was in follow up to the the answer a moment ago about pesticides, and then I have a second question after that, please. Um, because I thought I heard him say neo. I never say that right. Neo, neo nic the thing that sounds like nicotine. Um, <laughs> But that, that's so specifically, if it's bred into plants, toxic to bees. So I, I think I must have heard him wrong or misunderstood, because that seems like an absolute no-no pesticide. Um, that's one question. The other is about mulch, because I live in a community where they're going to dump lots of mulch on our beds. Um, and we, we have terrible soil, and we don't have any irrigation. So uh, I think the idea that I, they're probably doing it to prevent um, 
opportunistic weeds from growing under the beds, but I'd like to know what the, for fireflies, for insects in general, and even soil health, the downside of that is, or if there's a way to do it that isn't so downsided. Yeah, um, I'll talk about the, the first one, the neonicotinoid uh, issue. It's hard to say exactly what your pest control company is using. That's why you kind of have to ask questions regarding that. Uh, the, the main issue is that that pesticide is, is water soluble and it does kill beetles. They use that pesticide. Um, you've obviously heard about the issues with pollinators and yeah. stuff. And one of the ways that they discovered it was bad was because it the runoff from those agricultural fields that used it. Um, it was uh, affecting native habitats on the borders, essentially. Um, and uh, pest control companies do use it in order to address, uh, you know, certain things. It is a big no-no, but they still do use it. So that's why we're in this kind of gray area right now with that, that compound. You can go to Lowe's or Home Depot right now and still buy it. Um, so it's just a really good idea to ask questions. Now, um, you know, they might use other things like pyrethrum or a variety of different other, uh, pesticides to control things, but, um, you know, that's, you know, there's lawn granules and stuff like that. Sometimes they get questions about beneficial nematoids too. Um, and those are kind of a no, no at this point, cause those nematoids will eat firefly larva. Um, so there's a lot of things that, um, you know, can impact fireflies. And so it's just good to ask questions and then just kind of have a little bit more control with it instead of giving the pest control companies like free reign uh, to, to do that. Um, and we would just really want to, if anything, just avoid overspray and like contamination of native environments um, that are nearby. Um, regarding the mulch uh, issue is this, um, firefly females are going to lay eggs in soil. And if there's a heavy mulch in those areas, they're not gonna lay eggs in that mulch, um, much less are the eggs gonna be able to survive in the mulch as well. The other issue is that heavy mulch layers prevent nutrients and moisture from getting into the soil. Um, and so this actually has a negative benefit to actually increasing the soil um, development in your area. Um, because you know if it's, it's a thick mulch layer about this thick, there's not a lot that's gonna get through that. Um, now, weeds won't be able to go up, but uh, nutrients and things that you need in order to you know, encourage a healthy soil ecosystem are gonna to do that or not eliminate. So you wanna use mulch that's gonna break down um, and uh, maybe try tactics like using vinegar or something like that to spray weeds that are gonna emerge early on. Um, now, there are beneficial types of mulch, those that like uh, do contain some compost in it, um, and do have like leaf litter and leaf matter in it. Not all, all mulch is not all bad. It does break down. It does like add to soil development. You just want to avoid those like mulch volcanoes and those really heavy mulch beds um, that over time, basically it's, a, it's almost like concrete, acts like concrete to do that. So um, again, this is a, a, one of those where you just kind of maybe need to get a little involved with it and they might, you know, push back on it, but just say, hey, we want to encourage some th new things here and we want to, you know, uh, allow for the rainwater to penetrate into the soil. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much, um, Ben. I appreciate all of your in-depth expertise. Um, thank you for providing a like really cool educational experience about fireflies. Thank you so much, Maureen, for sharing all of your projects and Linda too. Um, you guys do such amazing work over there. Thank you, Kevin, for joining us. I do have some questions that I'll direct after um, the webinar to the speakers that we weren't able to get to. Um, and, and we're at the top of the hour. This hour has kind of flown by. Uh, but before we go, we always like to close um, with a prayer. And then we also um, would ask that you provide us some survey, um, provide us some feedback um, with this survey link in the chat. Uh, we greatly appreciate I'm hearing your thoughts on our programming. And if you have any ideas for future topics, please feel free to put that in the survey. And if we can move to the next slide, thank you so much, Natalie, for putting that in. Um, this is actually um, a native flower to Maryland. It's very beautiful. I love this. Um, the color is just amazing. And I'm looking forward to seeing more of these as our flowers start to come into bloom. And so this is just a nice spring prayer um, to close the, tonight's program with. Dear God, spring is a metaphor for change. Some changes we eagerly await and some we abhor. Some changes we plan and others arrive 
uninvited. To all these changes, we ask the gift of your perspective beckoning us to expectation, hope, and rebirth. May the sunlight and the rain be reminders that you are at work renewing the earth. As a God of renewal, you are ever at work in our lives too. Open our eyes and lives to the needed changes in our lives this spring. Awaken us to new life and perspective. Amen. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we do, and we'll look forward to seeing you at the next Learning Lab. Thank you so much.